Hi everyone and welcome back. This video is going to be about, about stimulus discrimination versus stimulus generalization. It's important to understand the differences between those two. Generalization is how we generalize our behaviors and discrimination is how we train our different behaviors. Understanding the difference will help you create programs for generalization. The definition of stimulus discrimination is to tell the difference between different stimuli and respond only to the correct cue. Saying the word red when shown a red car is stimulus discrimination and not saying red when shown a green car. Now, stimulus generalization is responding to stimuli in the same way. So the learner expands their behavior again cross similar cues and response to different but stimu similar stimuli in the same way. So saying dog for many different breeds of dogs and both of these skills are really important. The discrimination helps people or learners respond correctly while generalization helps them apply the skills in real world examples or context. So what's a stimuli? We've talked about this before. It's anything in the environment that can influence behavior. You can break all the stuff that comes before behavior into a couple things. There's our prompts, our antecedents, like our environmental modifications, and then a pro stimuli are both of those. It's a term for all of that. So examples of stimuli are sounds, words, objects, people, anything within the environment. A discriminative stimuli signals that reinforcement is available if you respond in a certain way, and we call those our SDs. Stimulus discrimination occurs when a learner responds to a specific stimuli, and the learner learns to tell the difference between different stimuli and they respond only to the correct cue. The learner has learned to discriminate the appropriate stimuli. So, and we learned about this, this is what discrimination training is, it's how we do that matching to sample, it's how we do all the reflexology, transitivity, all those things. We do that through discrimination training, and that's a teaching intervention. It really could fall into differential reinforcement or antecedent, it just depends on how you approach it, but it's how we teach a lot of the skills that we're showing people. We're trying to get our learners to learn. An example of stimulus discrimination is the learner says red when shown a red car and doesn't say red when not shown a red car. If they sh are shown a green car, they don't say the word red. And so the learner follows line up but not sit down. So the learner has learned to respond to the instruction line up and not generalize their response to other instructions like sit down. And the child answers to their name, but not to other names. This is all stimulus discrimination. And there's lots of situations where we need stimulus discrimination. And it needs to be, we call it how well they discriminate. We have two words for it. It's either very tight or very loose. It's almost like a spectrum. Sometimes we need it to be super tight. Sometimes it can be a little bit loose. Say the word mom, we probably want that really tight because most people have one mom. There's occasions where someone might have multiple moms. And so in that case, you might want it to be a little bit looser because they can refer to multiple people as mom in an appropriate way. Um, so it's very individualized to the person, like how much discrimination we want, how tight we want that discrimination to be. For colors, like typically we want pretty tight discrimination most people, most, you know, kids, there's an expectation that when they see red, they can say red. When they see green, they can say green. But if you're working with college students in an art class on colors, we might want that a little looser because we might want them to say red for a lot of different shades of red. Stimulus generalization occurs when the learner responds differently to similar stimuli, but in the same way. So this expands behavior. It allows us to grow our behavior. Key phrases is response to similar cues in the same way. And it's a crucial skill that allows us to generalize. When you've taught a behavior and they respond, they every time this happens, they respond 
to that behavior correctly. They respond with this behavior correctly. But now we want to generalize it to other texts, to other environments. We start loosening that control. Um, so saying dog when you see a poodle, bulldog, cartoon dog. So dog is a great one because the stimuli that it's appropriate to say the word dog with is so broad. Like calling a tiny white Maltese a dog. I used to have one. She unfortunately passed. But a Newfoundland looks kind of like a St. Bernard and is typically black, sometimes a little white. And they're huge. They look like a bear. That's also a dog. So I need my learner to see the tiny little poodle say dog and see the giant bear and say dog. They're so different. So you want dog to be extremely loose when you teach it because it's so many different things. And then we get into cartoons and pictures, drawings of dogs, and even those can look a little different. So you want to teach them all those different things as dogs. So you want very loose training on the word dog. But if you're teaching breeds, you want pretty tight training. You don't want them to say Maltese when they see the Newfoundland or say Newfoundland when they see the Maltese. The learner waves hello to mom, teacher, and crossing guard. So you might start reinforcing them waving hello to mom, but then we might want that looser because we could wave to many different people appropriately. You know, your teacher, the crossing guard, your neighbor, your friend. And so we start trying to loosen that. The learner follows cleanup, whether it's said by a teacher or a therapist. A lot of times the person giving the cue because they're the only ones giving the cue, it's a very tight training. But if you have multiple people giving the cue, it will be a looser training. In a lot of directions, we want pretty loose. Not too loose because, you know, you don't want the older kid who's maybe a little bossy to tell the learner to clean up and they have to clean up every time another kid says it. That would be inappropriate. So you want it kind of loose, but not too loose that anybody can get your learner to do whatever they want. That's always a safety concern that's discussed a lot because we do train compliance so much. And there's a lot of situations where someone should not be compliant. It's better for their safety or better for their mental health just not to be compliant. So you want to train them on those too when not to be compliant. Why both skills matter, discrimination helps our learners respond correctly, teaches learners to distinguish between specific cues and respond accordingly. Generalization helps learners apply the skill, so it, it cues real-world situations. Both are needed. They're both really important for functional, flexible behavior, and there are situations where we need tight discrimination and situations where we need it very loose to move into generalization. And we teach this by reinforcement. The learner responds to a specific stimuli and not to others. They tell the difference between the cues. We use discrimination training for this. We provide reinforcement only for correct responses. We use error correction. We practice with non-examples. And we gradually introduce stimuli that we do want them to continue to respond to. When a learner says red, when they're shown a red card and follows line up, but doesn't line up when they hear, they hear sit down. So it helps the learner respond to specific situations, key for functional and flexible behavior. So stimulus generalization occurs when a learner responds to different but similar stimuli in the same way. So the response is still same. The learner expands their behavior across similar cues. The learner says dog when sees a poodle, bulldog, or cartoon dog. The learner waves hello to mom, teacher, or crossing guard. We help the learners apply skills in real world. It's really, it creates this functional, flexible behavior that people can use everywhere. To teach this, we use multiple examples of target stimuli. We vary things and we continue to reinforce the behavior across variations. And you want to use natural cues that occur in the environment. This is a spectrum. The stimulus discrimination side is tight and the stimulus generalization is loose. And it just totally depends on where on the spectrum you need that behavior to be. So whether you want real tight stimulus discrimination or really loose stimulus generalization. 
And again, it's also individualized for the person, like the mom example. Someone might have a stepmom and that person needs to be or should with, you know, they want to call that person mom too and the family wants that. Or they might have two moms who are a couple together and they have to learn to call both those people mom. You don't want them to start calling the teacher mom. That would be a little inappropriate. Even the mom example, to a certain extent, it's like, yeah, we'll train that a bit. It's not that big a deal if someone starts calling their teacher mom. You might train it if it's continuous and kind of the teacher, everybody's having a bit of a problem with it. But you also might just let that one work itself out. I always use that example and I'm like, I don't know if I'd even train that. I just might let it work. A lot of these will work themselves out eventually. But if they have one mom, nobody else's can be called a mom. You might want that to be really tight discrimination. Labeling animals, stimulus discrimination, the learner says cat when shown a cat, but not when shown a dog or a rabbit, stimulus generalization, a learner says cat when shown a real cat, a cartoon cat, or a stuffed cat. That's how we build concepts. When the learner associates the word cat with various representations of the animal, which are all correct, we would say you built the concept of cat. So discrimination, though you would want the learner to respond to the instruction, touch your nose, but not to touch your ears. So if you don't want them touching their ears, then you would not want them to respond to that instruction. There's not a lot of real world applications for that. The only thing I would say is maybe if they had ear infections, you might be training that way. A stimulus generalization, the learner touches their nose, whether the RBT parent or teacher gives that instruction. The learner answers a specific response blue when asked what color is the sky, but doesn't say blue for what color is the grass. The learner answers the same specific response blue when asked what's the color of water, what's the color of the sky. Identifying people. So a child says mom when they see their mom, not other women. The child says mom when they see their mom in person, photos, or videos. That would be generalization. Reading words. The learner says dog correctly, but not dig or dot. A generalization would be the learner reads dog, whether it's written bold script or all caps. So you can see there's ways you might need generalization or discrimination for different stimuli for the same concept or ideas. Coping skills. So learner uses deep breathing only when reminded by a teacher during math. Then the learner uses deep breathing during math recess and at home when upset. You can use coping skills to manage their emotions. The learner says thank you when given a snack, but not when given a toy. I'm just giving examples. I don't know that that's a real situation you would train someone in. The learner says, thank you when given a sack toy or opening the door. Common errors to watch for is overgeneralization. The saying thank you gets overgeneralized a lot. That was trained so hard, so strict that they say thank you multiple times. They're like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Even though I gave them like one like I gave them a napkin and all you have to do is say thank you. That would be appropriate. They'll say things too much. That's overgeneralization. Another one, this one was so cute. This one, no one trained. It just was reinforced in the environment. But the child said, that's so funny. They kept saying that. And I think people would just laugh at that. They like the laughter. So they started saying, that's so funny if anyone said anything to them. You'd be like, oh, you know, Molly let's go get our blocks. That's so funny because it's been reinforced so much. They overgeneralize that themselves. And this stuff can help us train or do therapy, but also describes what's going on in our real world. Failing to generalize, responding only to one specific context instead of across similar situations. Um, confusing instructions with SD. So general instructions are really considered discriminative stimuli. They're cues for specific responses and then reinforcing incorrect responses inconsistently. So not reinforcing consistently. Okay, so discrimination is learner tells the difference between cues and then generalization is learner expands response to similar cues. And then we're going to use both. It just will depend on what we need for that concept. 
Um, and we're going to do this through prompting examples and consistent reinforcement.